Hey, welcome everybody. Another uh, Bitcoin Cash site builder interview today with Sakib Noor of One Dot Surgery. How are you doing today, Sakib? I'm doing really good. Thanks, George. Uh, real pleasure to be here. Thank you so much. Pleasure's all mine. So you're building a uh, One Dot Surgery. Uh, can you tell us uh, what is that and why does it matter? That's a that's a really good question, George, because it's actually an incredibly complex answer. And to understand one surgery, you almost need to understand global surgery. Global surgery is a movement that's been developing over the last five or six years across the world when clinicians, surgeons, anesthetists, obstetricians, healthcare professionals, governments have started to realize there's a massive lack of surgical access to a large part of the world. And by a large part of the world, we're talking about five billion people. Two thirds of the world's population don't have access to surgical care. Just take a moment to think about whichever country you're in right now. Just imagine if the surgical services suddenly stopped. That in itself would be a catastrophe. Imagine if you didn't have surgical services for the whole population for their entire lives, 30, 40, 50 years worth of pathology that's been developing. So the Lancet Commission, which is a study that was done by multiple organizations and multiple people in 2015 said that there was 5 billion people without access to surgery. And they also proved that economically, it's much better to or much cheaper to have access to surgery than the massive economic loss of not treating people that have disease that can be imminently treated. So again, injuries kill more people in the world than HIV, TB, malaria combined. But a lot of the global health focuses on those communicative diseases rather than injury. But if a, an adult loses their ability to work because of injury, the economic loss is vast. If a mother has a problem during her pregnancy and a child develops cerebral palsy, the cost to the state is vast for the rest of the you know, child's life. And this neglect, um, not just on a humanitarian basis, is awful but on an economic basis is terrible as well. So global surgery is this movement that's trying to solve this massive problem. And one surgery is a tiny piece of that jigsaw piece. And why is it a, a jigsaw puzzle? Surgery is complex. It's infrastructure, it's supply chains, it's resources, it's policies, it's um, most importantly, it's human resources and the skill set of people to be able to treat that pathology. So one surgery, to answer the question, um, is a web platform designed by myself and a small team to address some of the um, needs of the people that are providing those surgical services in the, in the entire world. It's an open access free platform that gives educational services, research services, advocacy services to help improve the quality of care that ultimately gets trickle down to the patients at the bottom. And so we've been doing it for three or four years and slowly improving and, and developing some cool stuff. Excellent. Yeah. I mean, I checked out your, your flip starters. You have a flip starter running right now, uh, your website, your merch store. I mean, it's all, it's all very cool. And the thing that's most interesting to me is because I, I also have an interest in the developing world. I've lived in the developing world possibly for the majority of my life, actually, now, even though I was born in the US. And I just see so much potential um, in the developing world. Fern Hern uh, Hernando de Soto, for example, in his book, The Mystery of Capital, really uh, brought home the fact of like just the basics of civilized life, especially in the realm of like property registry and money, are lacking in the developing world. And this, I feel like this lack of access to surgery is a real you know, could could almost be, well, I think it's, it's both a consequence, but also a cause, right? Because you mentioned that people who, who can't get surgery can spend decades being unable to realize their, their potential, being able to labor or to, to, to pursue their, the vision that they have for their life. Right. Right. It's, it's a, it's a, it's a chicken and egg type of situation. It's, it's completely circular. No, no income in the country, lack of healthcare services, lack of healthcare services, produces more economic loss and it just constantly um, just worsens. So for, for sure, 
being, you know, a, a better income country will then, you know, solve some of the healthcare crises that are occurring. And so there, there's a there's a definite connection between the two. Um, so monetary policy, economics, and healthcare are just so so closely related. I mean, it's the the destruction and the poverty that I've seen in my you know working in low and middle income countries are, are, are scenes that you think shouldn't occur in the 21st century. Or, you know, they, they shouldn't be happening. Um, you know, I have harrowing stories of of things I've seen in different parts of the world and. It's those stories that have motivated me to keep trying to solve these issues, you know, through a collaborative and collective effort. But these things shouldn't be happening. You know, the bottom line is mm. a lot of these conditions don't need, you know, in- incredible first world technology to treat. A lot of it is simple things. And um, and so it, it doesn't even need a, a sometimes a strong economy to solve some of these issues. It just needs organization. And mm-hmm. a will to a will to treat. Hmm. So tell us about yourself, uh, Shakib. How did you, you know, get into all of this? You know, what's your evolution? Um, that's a, it's another kind of funny question because it's been a journey for myself, both physically, literally a physical journey, as well as kind of emotionally and spiritually. I qualified from medical school in two thousand and four, and I'm currently a fully qualified orthopedic surgeon working in the UK. Uh, with a specialist interest in pediatrics, so children's injuries and children's deformities. Um, I think all clinicians or you know doctors at some point go through midlife crises or question their their kind of uh, their focus. And so in 2008, I I kind of left the UK with a view to explore the world and possibly even consider quitting medicine altogether. And I went to South Africa for a year. And it was in South Africa that was probably my most life changing moment when. Again, working in the surgical environment uh, in trauma cases and seeing the vast difference between what was in the UK, what was in South Africa, and also within South Africa between the the rich and the poor. And it made me just like completely uh, obsessed with learning about healthcare systems and what was the differences between, you know, uh, different parts of the world and how things could improve. And that journey then led me to Haiti after the earthquake. And so I volunteered with an organization there in a very small project, but again, seeing the devastation and destruction of even worse than South Africa. And you kind of see what's going on there, followed by volunteering in Pakistan after a, a massive flood that took, took out the entire country. Went to Cambodia and worked there for a year um, and started to learn and educate myself because it's not just about practicing medicine or, or, or learning about the clinical side, but I went and did master's degrees and public, you know, on, on stuff about trauma surgery, about catastrophe medicine, and just try to get a focus and understanding of the bigger picture. That, as well as continuing my orthopedic uh, training, I went to Australia for six months, worked and lived in Canada for a year. So I've kind of been in five or six continents for a significant period of my time learning about all these things. And I published a book in 2017. I kept diaries of everything I'd seen, and I published this book about my experiences and it was around about in 2017, after publishing this, I realized, actually, this story is not about me. It's, it's really about the people on the ground who are doing the, the work day in, day out, not writing stories, not traveling around, not being a surgical tourist, which I sometimes consider myself to be. But those heroes on the ground is what it was all about. And that's when I then pivoted from, right, I'm never going to talk about myself. I don't want to be on the limelight. I don't want to be writing. I actually want to promote and give tools to people to to do that themselves. And that's how One Surgery kind of started 2000, 2000, 2017, 18. I was like, okay, I'm going to dedicate a portion of my energy to that. And on the side of it, you know, again, it's it's just funny how I've ended up serendipitously in this position. I was a complete geek as a teenager. I loved web design. I loved designing. You know, you'll see One Surgery stuff and it's a bit funky and it's a bit funny, but it's just stuff I've been building completely as a hobby. Um, GeoCities, huh. Angel Fire. I had, a, I had a GeoCities website when I was a kid and yeah. Um, I, I continued making websites throughout medical school and, you know, actually was doing a bit of freelance work to just try and fund my way through uh, a few parts of, uh, of my training. And I started to learn a few different skills on web design. I started to use that ability to design web apps to solve problems in the healthcare profession. So in Cambodia, I created a completely um, unique kind of patient management software, really cheap, but really powerful. And then in Toronto, awesome. you know, 
in a you know one of the biggest hospitals in the world i created an educational platform that was again completely unique and i started realizing that actually a lot of this web stuff is you can create pretty cheaply mm-hmm. and you, if you know what you're doing and you've got good design or user interfaces you can solve problems that perhaps somebody who's not a clinician who doesn't use that service as well maybe not seen it in a different in a different um in a different light and and i think that skill set somehow that i managed to obtain plus seeing the poverty and destruction of global surgery plus being motivated to somehow solve it has just led me to this kind of very odd position that i'm in right now <laughs> one surgery again and, and the team behind it uh, i wouldn't call it odd i would call it a leadership position you know a visionary kind of position the right. what you mentioned before about you know the story is is about other people as well uh, you know, is your, your, I mean, I looked over the website at one dot surgery earlier and I could see you're empowering new leaders there. And that's so powerful. It's, it's, you know, it's one thing to, to be a leader, to influence, uh, to help people. But another thing is to, um, you know, to give essentially kind of give birth to a whole new level of leadership, right? Where you're not, you're not just helping people individually here, you're doing surgery here and there, but you're actually helping a whole new group of people to replicate the kind of kinds of things that you've been doing to empower them. And that's incredibly powerful, I think. Right. And I, th- and I think that's, you're absolutely right. And I think a lot of the global surgery movement historically you know, 20 years ago, you'd have surgical missions, right? You'd have somebody in the, in the West would pack their bags, put some instruments in their, in, their, in their suitcase and go and help and operate. And it's, you know, ethically controversial whether that's a correct model of care. But now people are starting to realize, actually, if you're going to solve 5 billion people's surgical diseases, you're going to need leaders and you're going to need people who are, who are trained and not just in their surgical skill, but ability to create new policies and solutions in their own environments. And um, yeah, I think I think that's what people are doing. One surgery is part of it, and like I said, it's a very small part of it. But um, you know, we try in a different way. We we have a grassroots movement. We have the the target is to just empower people in low and middle income countries to do what they feel is right. That's that's spectacular. So. Um, at some point, you encountered uh, Bitcoin Cash. So, how did you encounter Bitcoin Cash, and why did you decide to make One Dot Surgery a Bitcoin Cash centric organization? You know, this is um, again, it's all serendipity, but it's it's all kind of landing into this perfect spot where BCH and everything it stands for, and learning about the fork in 2017, and the belief that Bitcoin is a a global borderless peer-to-peer instant you know, currency um, really started again around about the same time. And it was serendipitous that, you know, one of my wife's best friends uh, was heavily involved in the Eat BCH South Sudan campaign. Oh, okay. And, um, and you know, I had no, I, I knew about crypto, I, you know, probably dabbled in some Bitcoin and XRP and, you know, you know, a complete naive guy who doesn't know what he was doing. Um, and, uh, you know, XRP to the moon and what thing. Well, we all uh, started like that, don't worry. Right, right. <laughs> and, um, and so I learned about Bitcoin Cash um, through her and, you know, uh, some of her friends and about EBCH e- and the work they were doing in South Sudan. And then for the next six months, I just started learning about the Bitcoin Cash ecosystem, not just about, you know, their philanthropy and some of their work of what they were doing in, in low middle income countries, similar to yourself and some of your projects, but um, then learned about Flipstarter because again it just demonstrate it demonstrated to me a, com- a community of crypto enthusiasts who were actually trying to genuinely make the world a better place. It wasn't just about you know speculation. It wasn't just about you know price accumulation, but it was a group of people that believed in a initial you know, theory of, of what Bitcoin Cash was. And then we're trying to improve on it. And so the Flipstarter was, you know, in 2020, still learning massively about Bitcoin Cash, but that's when it began. That's when One Surgery's journey into Bitcoin Cash developed. And then as we started to use it for a very unique unique case of, of research, but we started to use it in other in other realms. 
and it just became like this is so much better than everything um and and i was looking around what other organizations are using this in the same ways that we're doing and i'm like there's no there genuinely isn't anybody that's not crypto focused we don't care about crypto i mean we care about crypto but we don't we, our reason for being isn't about crypto and it's not about bitcoin cash but we have seen how bitcoin cash can massive it's not even an exaggeration massively facilitate our global projects in ways that no other currency can and because bitcoin cash is there to be appear to be a digital cash system it's not trying to be a supercomputer it's not trying to be a store of value it's designed for what we need it for we need peerless you know borderless quick instant transactions that are cheap and and so the community plus the technology just it fit it's just fit really well so we became a bitcoin cash centric organization let's just embrace it right <laughs> let's see where we go yeah, that that idealism. I feel like we have a lot of idealism in the Bitcoin Cash ecosystem. You know, we are uh, sometimes maybe tilting at windmills a little bit, but we're always focused on really building something substantive. And that's the, I I love that we have all of these uh, people in Bitcoin Cash building on Bitcoin Cash. Uh, people like you and I who are are you know, are idealistic, have some level of idealism that's inspiring their work. Um, so so what, what aspect was it of Bitcoin Cash that you found most useful? Was it just the fact that, you know, it was, it you know, it just crosses borders as if they didn't exist or? Yeah, I mean, I think there's, um, you know, I think we've all, <laughs> the more you get into crypto, the, the more of a philosopher and, uh, you know, you, you develop your own, you know, systems or, or beliefs of why you think you know crypto is important and i know that a lot of particularly bitcoin cash uh, kind of uh, narrative has been about uh, spending and merchant adoption and you know being able to accept um bitcoin cash payments but i took a step back and for me my my belief or my value of a currency is the one that i earn in you know i've earned in different currencies south african rand you know Canadian dollars, wherever I've been, I've earned different currencies. And the one I cher- the, the currency I cherish the most is the one that I earn in. Mm-hmm. And so for me, the actual concept of using a currency for an employer and an employee, being able to pay and uh, earn, is probably the most valuable currency from a global perspective uh, that, that's, a, that's useful. The spending is, is nice, um, but the earning uh, is, is key. So we have now de- we're trying to develop within one surgery an entire Bitcoin Cash ecosystem that not only do we, you know, earn Bitcoin Cash through our projects and develop products that are, you know, Bitcoin Cash centric and, you know, take, we take Bitcoin Cash as part of our, our, our way to get Bitcoin Cash into the ecosystem, but then we distribute it and we spread it. So we give it to our, uh, you know, our staff for, for the work they do across the world. We give it out to awards to different parts of the world who've never heard of it and say, hey, here's some awards. We're distributing it. We, you know, the, the, the research model, which we haven't quite talked about yet, which is critical, um, is distributing Bitcoin Cash throughout the scientific community, both to the authors, the peer reviewers, back to the journal, back to the authors, back to the peer reviewers, back to charities with no no middlemen so it's an entire bch ecosystem and and that for me is what what bch has become it's it's a currency that we trade in and we rotate and and that's how i feel adoption works the merchant stuff is great and being able to spend it in different is you know really important as well but the sustainability of it is when it's flowing through your entire projects coming in going out coming in going out Uh, and so why has Bitcoin Cash been critical to that? Because you can send 10 cent. That in itself is incredible. Mm-hmm. Um, you can send it instantly. There's no the minimal fees um, and it's borderless. The, um, the transparency of, the, uh, of, a, um, of a blockchain is also helpful for a nonprofit and a charity. And I appreciate if people want anon- anon- anonymous you know, transactions and the privacy. But there's a part of the... The, the world that actually values openness 
why why is a Bitcoin Cash donor going to give to one surgery? Is because we have the ability to be completely transparent. We don't have a fiat bank account. And it's incredibly liberating. I went to look for a fiat bank account for one surgery. I was like, let me set up a business and do it properly and have a company and we'll apply for a bank account and go through all those steps. And it was just it was just painful. There was a charge, there was, you know, a lot of bureaucracy. And I'm like, well, we have a wallet. We have a ledger. It's all on chain. You can see exactly, we've got one address, so there's no messing around. Like, hey, we're going to accept payments in this address. And you can see what's coming in and out, and we'll, we'll annotate it. And so that part of it is incredibly useful as well. So all these little features that make the, the Bitcoin Cash cryptocurrency we're using in very unique ways, paying our staff with Western Union was the original you know, technique. Because if we needed to pay somebody in Ethiopia, Nigeria, India, there's no system. How am I going to get dollars to those guys? Um, Western Union is it's just crazy. Like, but that's because no one's got PayPal. Not every everybody's got access to PayPal. Not everybody's got access to Venmo. But if you say get a Bitcoin Cash wallet address, it's five clicks on a you know download an app. You're no different to anyone else, and and you get a payment instantly. And so it just made international. Payments easy. It made being transparent easy, um, and I genuinely think that other organisations will look at that and say, "To be honest, that's so much better." We've just spent five hundred dollars trying to get a payment to the USA uh, to an organisation that doesn't, you know, very you know, traditional organisation accepts check and bank transfers, and that five hundred dollars mm-hmm. has taken two weeks and it's it's lost in the system. Oh my goodness. <laughs> And I'm like, dude, <laughs> like if I, if you didn't accept a Bitcoin Cash, I could have just sent it to you. It's, uh, have it's you funny. thought? Yeah, for that kind of situation, you might uh, consider localcryptos.com. You right. can find us a buyer for the BCH that's local too, and they can just deposit it into the bank account probably. Right. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's right. And um, it was just a, it was just a bit um, learning those processes and how we can do how we can do it. Um, because other organizations, I think in the global health uh, and you know international sphere, it, once they start picking up on this, may just it'd be a lot easier if they just adopted. I'm not saying they have to adopt Bitcoin Cash. I'm not a my crypto versus your crypto type of guy, but if they adopted this new technology, the the transferring of you know service money for services and goods becomes just so much more efficient. Hmm. Yeah, and BCH, I mean, BCH is everywhere. It's, you know, US Bank, PayPal, Venmo, I mean, BitPay, you know, local crypto. So, you know, yeah, I mean, people can just adopt crypto and just figure out Bitcoin Cash is probably going to be the most convenient one for them to use for payments. Right. Uh, that's yeah. right. And, I th- and, I, and that's what I really hope institutions will start figuring out. Because I think they're a step behind us. Like One Surgery is the only organization that's, I don't know any other non crypto organization that's like all in. Um, and so if you're all in, it gives, it gives an, an opportunity for others to study your experience. So I think we're kind of trailblazing through it and we're starting to get attention in that, in that field. People are not just looking at this research model, which I think will, will generally start to take off very soon, but they're also looking at the organizational side of it and saying, actually, we like what they're doing and we can be, we can follow or replicate it. Uh, and so I think um, outstanding. I think, good. I think I don't know. We don't know what the future is, but uh, yeah, no, it's exciting. I think twenty twenty two is starting to turn heads for us. Hmm. Yeah, and what you mentioned before about the power of earning and uh, you know paying salaries and whatnot with BCH, that's 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 so important. You know, like with my team in Caracas. Um, you know, I pay everybody in BCH and it's so powerful and they're so amazed by it. Um, and, and that's the whole inflows thing that I talk about a lot in the, in the, uh, BCH, uh, ecosystem is you have to have inflows and only then really do merchants start to make sense, you know, cause I saw, uh, someone on, on your site had received, maybe it was in Tunisia, a stipend. And uh, and they said, oh, I cashed it out to, you know, my local fiat. But if there were then merchants in that area, then they wouldn't have to absorb the fees or the inconvenience. They could just go and spend it to get what they needed right away. 
I think that's that's where the power of merchants come in. But definitely what you're saying, you know, we have to have those inflows first. We have to have the ability to earn uh, and to pay people in it. That's right. And I think, for, again, philosophically, why do I use cash? I use it to earn. I use it to pay, uh, spend, invest, and save. And I think if Bitcoin Cash wants to compete in all of those sectors, it needs some of the tools to uh, to make it valuable to to um, to do that. So, for an earning perspective, like I would say, the infrastructure, the wallet infrastructure, the banking account isn't isn't robust enough, right? I mean, you're using it, we're using it, but there's no easy way to get a payroll. There's no easy way to like if I'm paying twenty people on a payroll. You know, it's very frustrating to have to do one thing at a time. So these yes. uh, uses and needs can only start to be developed once organizations are, are trying to use it. And then you develop a bank account that's amazing, right? And then you can spend, so you can earn and pay salaries through a good tool. Similarly with spending, I'm going to want BCH if I can get a better deal spending on BCH rather than fiat. So what Satoshi's Angels are doing, you know, the last few days, I've noticed that they're doing a 20% cashback. It's amazing. Mm-hmm. If I if I, if it takes me five percent to switch from fiat to BCH, but then I get twenty percent back when I spend it, then I have much more incentive to spend a currency that you know I'm getting a better deal on. And people will spend you now. People will spend hours trying to get a small discount. You know, you go shopping and people go round the shops for just for five percent discount or finding one you know pair of shoes that's two dollars cheaper than the other. So mm. if you can incentivize spending uh, and make it useful for people to spend and get a better deal and and make the tools easier to earn, you know, I can see how the economy will develop. Um, that's, how, that's how I see it's going to, it could go or should go. Definitely. So how you ran a flip starter um, late last year. Uh, how was your experience uh, with uh, running a flip starter in the BCH space? You know, um, I've never run a crowdfunding campaign. Um, I've always wanted to. Actually, it was one of my bucket lists during my uh, kind of life. I was like, oh, I really want to do a crowdfunding. You've got all these other um, type of uh, fiat online crowdfunders. So the flip start of one, it's, it's funny because, the um, again, the software and the user interfaces is not an, you know, a natural thing to, to learn how to do. There's kind of technical issues, how to actually set it up. Um, Installing it, I I couldn't figure out how to get an SSL H you know an SSL certificate on my Digital Ocean thing, so I've had to pay somebody to do that on on both occasions. Mm. Um, you know, it, it doesn't look pretty. You know, I'm a des- I like designing. <laughs> I like things to you know I like things to pop. Um, I, I like I like colors and inspirational images and and things. And so it, it's it's not beautiful, but that's all superficial and cosmetic stuff, right? Uh, and those are all things that can uh, be improved with time. But the amazing thing about it, A, is the is the trustless part of it. That's what, you know, the, the technology behind that is quite powerful. The fact that you're only going to get, no one's controlling that, you know, that BCH until it, until the flip starter campaign is complete. Um, no one can steal it. You're not relying on a third party. Uh, that, it, you know that narrative itself is incredibly, uh, incredibly powerful, and I think Flipstarter had it has if it had a better, you know, user interface, and made it a little bit easier for people to onboard. I think you you develop entrepreneur entrepreneur. You know, we're an entrepreneurial unit. We have we had no BCH knowledge or interest before that, and we've suddenly been encompassed into the BCH ecosystem. The way to get entrepreneurs in is to is for them to be able to raise capital for whatever whatever project. So. I think Flipstart is a great tool. I think um, it'd be nice if there was non-BCH related crowdfunding going on. It'd be nice if there's an easy way to onboard uh, for for uh, for non-BCH users. But um, yeah, it's great. Like, it's not easy crowdfunding. It's a lot of pressure and stress and keeping uh, keeping your donors happy. Um, yes, but uh, you know we're doing a second one and uh, <laughs> having some fun with it. So why not? 
Yeah, what you mentioned about, you know, it'd be nice if uh, Flipstarter was a little bit easier, uh, you know, especially for, you know, like al- entities uh, or people outside of the current BCH space. Actually, Shomari Prince and I are working on a project um, to make that happen. And we should have an MVP out um, this month. So That'd be amazing. I, I think it could be good. Because be I'm not, I'm not, a, I'm not a, a dev and I'm not, but I'm not completely non-technical. You know, I do know my way around some aspects of coding and some aspects of uh, computers, but um, <laughs> I, it blew my head. Like the the fact that you have to use markdown text, you know, you're learning thing, things that just completely, <laughs> unla- you know, markdown text and, and your bullet points go all crazy and um, all this type of things. Mm. And, uh, yeah, it, it would be it would be nice to have a, a, a more kind of cosmetically friendly way to inspire uh, donations. But, you know, um, the fact is most flip starters get funded. And I do think that at the moment it's it's probably, again, I haven't studied it, but there's probably a core 15 or 20 people that donate mm. most. Um, and I guess that's the same with all ecosystems, like the whales give more than the, you know, the little guys. But, uh, again, if there's more more BCH users who are more happy to, you know, donate, um, then I think it would inspire more campaigns. Yeah, I mean, hopefully, you know, these 20 or or however many core donors um, are going to, you know, give birth to, you know, dozens of projects that, you know, hopefully each one can bring in a few more donors, you know, and maybe in a year we could have a, a core group of 100 donors, you know, right. or maybe we'll see more more flip starters that um, you know are not directly related to you know building Bitcoin Cash, but to, to compatible things, you know things that are uh, interesting, you know like like what you're doing, and you know who knows what that could give birth to. Yeah, I think so. Um, it, it's it's how it's gonna it's 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 a great way to onboard people. Um, that's just completely community orientated. Um, you know, it's decentralized. Mm. There's elements of centralization that are important for projects, and Bitcoin Cash is very decentralized in how it how it operates. It's not one person, you know, controlling the decisions on how you're marketing it, how you're spreading it. It's literally people doing their own thing in their own little spaces. It has its positive, you know, it has you know a lot of advantages that way, but also some disadvantages. You know, I think if somebody's directing the whole process, you're probably you're probably going to be a little bit more organized in, in your messaging. But the decentralized concept leads to some, you know, uh, funny stuff. Uh, different projects. <laughs> Our pro- you know, I would call us an outlier. It's a very outlier. It's a very outlier project. But it's like, I still, I still, I read a lot about crypto and all the use cases and the DeFi and the NFTs and everything that everyone's doing. And I'm like, I still feel like we have the one of the only true use cases that actually, without crypto, the project can't exist. Um, yes, I ha- indeed. I mean, you're you're blazing a trail here, really. I mean, by create you're you're. This is one of the things that I that I like to say we should do more of in BCH, which which is we should try to do things that you with BCH that you actually can't do with fiat. You know, and you mentioned Western Union before. Um, about a decade ago, I tried to use Western Union. You know, I'm a U.S. citizen. I have all my documents. They wouldn't let me send any money. <laughs> it's a disaster it's a disaster and that's you know and so you are really illustrating i mean you're doing a whole bunch of things but among other things you're really in- illustrating that very basic um use case you know and it's real you know it's real it's not you know some you know nft of salt bay you know that's gonna sell for five million dollars you know and people are like what relationship does this have to reality this is real this is visionary this is philanthropic. This is helping real people in the real world. Um, this is, I think, this project, your project, One Dot Surgery, is so so valuable. Um, yeah, thank you. And, and so really, running... the, yeah. Sorry, go ahead. No, go ahead. Go ahead. No, and and really, the um, the the crown jewel of all our projects is is not even, you know, it is it's not specific to global surgery. It's specific to it's it's open to the entire scientific community, which is which in itself is uh, probably bigger than crypto in terms of actual importance. Um, 
the publishing industry has been a nightmare for for decades, and scientists have been kind of crushed by this publishing industry, not just in medicine, not surgery, but physics, maths, every scientific discipline has been completely crushed by a publishing industry that has been siphoning resources and money into a profiteering uh, industry that doesn't give back to a community that's trying to make the world better. So peer review and peer-to-peer science should be funded by peer-to-peer digital cash. I mean, the, the, the harmony between the two is so obvious and you've removed the middleman. You remove the, you remove the publisher that's taking resources away from the scientific community and you use a currency that actually allows transmission of value quickly because nothing is free. And uh, open access medicine, uh, open access journals, um, there is a cost associated with. There's always a production cost. If somebody says they can create something for free, it's not true. But mm-hmm. if you can if you can create something for very cheap and prove that you can create a, a good product for very cheap, then you can transmit that product on the back of a cryptocurrency that supports you know transmission of that knowledge uh, quickly. So. Um, that particular project, if successful, um, could be a model that the entire scientific community embraces. It, 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 I can't think of a better, easier, more simple model. And I've spent three years thinking about this. This isn't just you know come up um, out of a out of my out of my brain in in a few weeks. I've been thinking about this problem, and as soon as I saw Bitcoin Cash and the properties it had, I was like, well, let's just solve it. No one in the world can now not access science for 10 cents. Hmm. And I saw that you're using prompt.cash uh, right. for your journal. And also that you got the journal started with, I think I saw thir- about $13,000. Yeah. Which, which um, is extremely inexpensive. Right. Uh, and yeah. that's, that, that's based on just some of my web learning for the past few years, you know, like, I'm always shocked at how expensive technology is to produce. And as me as an amateur, I'm not creating the most amazing tech. You know, this is pretty basic, you know, stuff. I make it look nice. I make it flow well. I I think about Mm. it from a user point of view. It's not the most robust tech. It's not going to be the best code used. But with $13,000 and some experience in creating web apps, we've created a web app that clearly shows proof of concept. And it shows a completely new way of doing things. And then you integrate other parts of the the Bitcoin Cash network like Prompt.Cash because we needed a payment system. And the flip starter that I first had, I didn't have a solution to the payment system. I was like, I'm going to create the journal and I'm going to need a Bitcoin Cash payment system on top of that. So we're going to have a second flip starter to to raise the money to develop a a Bitcoin Cash payment integration system that works with our model. And then as we were developing the journal, Prompt.Cash turned up. I looked at their API. They were doing WordPress. They were doing other API things. Spoke to the uh, the developer, who was incredibly helpful to our project. Helped uh, you know integrate it, and now it works flawlessly. And it's just like mm. for nothing, right? Uh, the tech is there. So we were massively under budget in terms of our Flipstarter campaign. For thirty thousand, we completed the entire project. <laughs> yeah, Ecliptor, I think, is the uh, yeah, the, the main right. dev. Yeah, excellent, yeah. excellent. Yeah, he was amazing. Guy. Excellent, very, excellent very helpful. Dev. And what you're what you're discussing about open access to scientific knowledge, I mean, that's that makes me think of Aaron Swartz, right? Who who downloaded all that um, scientific information and then just made it freely available, right. to people. And so yeah, I mean, the 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 industry is such a mess that um, there's so many problems with it. So you have you have the the publishers that are profiteering. And they either take massive charges from the authors for three, three or four thousand dollars to publish one article, which t- it blows my mind how anybody can justify that kind of cost. Or they they take the copyright of it and they hide it behind a paywall. And so that's the current problem: is that the the profiteering publishing industry have just completely monopolized and and profiteered from the, from scientists. So scientists have been trying to figure out how we're going to how we're going to resolve it, and people have tried different ways. And one of the ways was SciHub. And I'm not sure whether your project is similar to that, but basically SciHub is an open repository, I think started in Russia, where they literally hacked into all the journals, took all the (laughs) paywalls out, 
and and put them all into a into a repository and now they're they're on the run because it's copyright law it's piracy and so yes the motive was correct because science should be open but the technique has left you know it, it's not sustainable because the publishers still have to pay their running costs so if you were to take away all their revenue then piracy wouldn't work and then you've got predatory or scam journals that will then pretend to be a really good journal and then they will charge three or four thousand um, dollars or something extortionate to authors to publish with them and it's just a it's just a scam just like crypto like there's no value in it and this model actually resolves all of that because you don't need piracy if you only need 10 cent of bitcoin cash to access an article mm-hmm. and if within a couple of days or within two you know however long it takes if the community pays off that article anyway you can wait three or four days and it's open anyway because the community's paid it off you don't need to be a scam because the authors don't the scam it takes away the scammers because there's no profit no one's stealing money if the author doesn't have to pay to publish then the scammer has nothing to you know to to propose right no no motive no incentive right so yeah. it, it solves everything um with no, with no with no risk in the publishing industry peer reviewers don't get paid like a peer reviewer a peer review publication is dependent on the peer review. That's the skill. That's the validation. That's the the thing that you're paying for. And peer reviews don't get paid or get any form of kind of recognition. So hmm. the um, the publisher just takes the profits, and hmm. the peer review gets a pat on the back and some you know token you know points or prestige. But the economy isn't towards the scientists. Whereas if if the journal then at least gives a little bit of Bitcoin cash to the peer review and say, hey, thank you. It's not a lot. It's five dollars. It's ten dollars. But hey, here's something for your work. That again goes back into the scientific community. That ten dollars, then the peer reviewer can then use that ten dollars to buy articles. And so it just becomes circular, or it's they can give start. that money. Yeah, and they get that money to charity. They're, and and so we've onboarded surgical charities because peer reviewers, we're doctors, we're clinicians. Sometimes we we like to volunteer and feel like we're helping our, our colleagues by peer reviewing. We feel like maybe uneasy about taking money. And so we've partnered with, with charities that now take Bitcoin Cash. So if the peer review says, hey, I don't want my Bitcoin Cash, give it to give it to a surgical charity rather than this rather than you know a shareholder of the profit you know the profiteering publishers. The money flows through the economy of the scientific community and no one's no one's profiteering. Cool. And you uh, you mentioned um, so you know, something that may have been gotten lost for uh, viewers who are not familiar. Um, but I think once you put up an article, right, you you use prompt.cash to charge for it. But then, like, let's say the, pr- the cost of producing it is $76. Then once people put $76 collectively into the prompt.cash uh, thing, then it becomes absolutely open to everyone. Is, is right. that right? Yeah, that's right. So it's a, it's a form of crowdfunding. Um, so the journal takes the article, doesn't charge the author, and publishes it once it meets its standards of peer review. And the journal very transparently, dollar by dollar, explains how much it costs to create that article. So we've reduced that cost from $3,000, what other people are charging, and transparently got it down to $76. Now, there's some going to be some wiggle and change in that because... Um, there's different costs to consider, but for now we've set our, you know, baseline price. So th- this cost us seventy six dollars, on the assumption that we're going to produce a hundred articles per year, because it's all about economy of scale. Mm-hmm. So without seventy six dollars, the uh, the price tag is on the article, and anybody can contribute whatever they want to that article, and if you want instant access, you pay anything you want from ten cent to the whole seventy six dollars. And you'll get instant access. You'll get first access to that article. And as soon as the journal starts recouping some of that money, as soon as it gets the $76 is cleared and the running costs of the journal have been recouped, then the article is essentially owned by the entire community because the community has paid for it. Um, the, prompt co- the prompt cash, uh, there's, two, there's two payment systems because it's not a, it's not a crypto-exclusive journal. I think that then excludes the rest of the fiat you know, fiat world. I think that's it's an inclusive concept where it's everyone, not just either or. Mm-hmm. But because accepting Bitcoin Cash is so much cheaper, 
than accepting fiat. If you have Bitcoin Cash, you can spend 10 cent and access the article. If you're using PayPal, which is currently our other you know, uh, payment network, uh, you have to pay $10. Hmm. So if you want to pay by credit card, that's fine. We'll accept your credit card because PayPal take a fee uh, and the running cost of, you know, of, of accepting fiat is just a little bit more. So yeah, you can access for $10, which is still a hell of a lot cheaper than what other journals are charging. But you can pay with fiat or you can pay with crypto. And so by accepting Bitcoin Cash, everybody in the world, as long as you've got internet access, you'll be able to access it. And you don't have to wait for somebody with fiat to open it up for you. Hmm. That's very cool. So now you're in the midst of uh, your second flip starter, uh, which is to fund uh, One Dot Surgery's activities in 2022. Um, what what are you going to do in 2022? What's your right. plan? What's your vision? So the the my vision was always that the organization becomes completely independent and sustainable with an income stream that um, doesn't re- require crowdfunding, doesn't require flip starter, doesn't require any external source. Um, and obviously with 2021 being so manic and how, how much we've been doing on other fronts, we haven't established a sustainable revenue yet. In fact, I was really hoping that NFT series, uh, which by the way, I still think is the best, like one of the best uses of NFTs that I can, I can think of, like genuine uses. It hasn't really had a chance to kick off. We set it up on SLP. We were hoping to sell some amazing NFTs. We were hoping that revenue would then create a genuine product that would help you know, sustain our activities, but it hasn't clicked enough for us. Uh, we had a shop and sell it, trying to sell, you know, merchandise, and we'd only need to sell two or three t-shirts a day. Hmm. If we had to sell three t-shirts a day for for a year, our entire running cost would be covered. And so, hmm. it's not a lot that we need. Our running costs are so low. But even with the shop that we've got, we haven't got that yet. So we haven't solved the sustainability issue. But our projects are growing and. The decision was made, well, why don't we do one more flip starter? And the income from that flip starter will then hopefully really establish some of our projects and expand. Um, so, for example, the journal, which should be sustainable in its own way once it's producing articles, um, needs a user base. It needs people to understand the model. It needs authors to start submitting. But we're not just using that money to market and just like advertise because you know, ultimately we care about surgeons and we care about access to surgery and we care about capacity building. So we are using some of that flip starter money to create courses because we've been contacted by different parts of the world, um, researchers and say, hey, we don't necessarily have the skills to create research, let alone publish. So if we were to create a an international course uh, that people in different parts of the world could use to get skills up, but at the same time, say, hey, once you've got your skills, don't get trapped into the publishing industry and have to pay $3,000 to publish scientific work that we're really interested in. Here's your publishing solution on top of it. You're not only marketing your journal solution, but you're increasing the skills of you know the, of the world's population of researchers. So we want to develop a course. We're about to sign a memorandum of understanding with a, a very, very big global surgery organization that's going to help us with a, with a massive awesome. global reach. So some of that flip starter money is going to help just propel that. And again, we, we're trying to minimize how much we spend, but you, you do need some running costs to get it going. Similarly, um, now that we're kind of becoming a little bit more recognized in the international space, there's been a lot of proposals about getting a web conference. Because again, these topics that I've talked about are so unique. And so I think of genuine interest to not just the crypto community, but the global health community we need to start sh- demonstrating that. And so some of the some of the um, flip starter money would help, again, develop a conference where we start educating our use cases of crypto as well as capacity building in the global surgery environment, um, developing our NFTs and really just having a pot. It's almost like a war chest of capacity building and marketing. So mm-hmm. I think uh, a product needs a network effect. Uh, we've got the product the network effect is part of that process and, and having some Bitcoin cash that we can continue to use will be helpful. So that's what we're, that's where we're doing. Cool. Cool. 
Yeah, I mean that sounds that sounds like a really interesting plan. Um, uh, I've I pledged just a small amount. It's at flipstarter two dot one dot surgery, right? right? And it's close to finishing, actually. So right. you know, by the time this, this I publish this video later this week, it may be your last chance <laughs> to get you know, to get I on mean, this um, Flipstarter. One of the fun things we did uh, was create a dashboard, and. Um, so we've got two campaigns and we've got two dashboards and it has lots of statistics and um, it's already interesting to just compare the two because you can see the, the how the campaign went and the, the number of donations and the size of the donations. And, you know, our initial campaign had a, a peak when we first launched and then there was a big lull and then a few little big peaks. And this one is just like, ooh, <laughs> it's gone <laughs> to the moon within a few days. And that's, that's nice to see. And we're going to keep those dashboards up because I think – Future users of Flipstarter uh, may want to see our campaign and learn from the marketing and use it as a model or not, or, or as a kind of a, a case a case study. Um, and so we keep that dashboard up and people can use it to, you know, plan their own campaigns because it's not easy. Like, I think crowdfunding is, is a challenge. Uh, you get a lot of criticism. You're in the public eye. Mm. You get, you'll get trolls who say this and that and, um, you know, it's yeah. not an easy job to do, but uh, we'll keep our dashboards up. And I think I'd love for the new Flipstarter, if you're making a new one, integrate some you know uh, some live statistics. It's quite cool. We call it Flip Blocks, Big Blocks. We want Big Blocks, which is you know big donations in the. So you can see the number of small donations and lots of little small blocks, and then a couple of big blocks is all you need to. Okay. Yeah, I'll pass that along to Shomari. Yeah, we're always looking for feedback. Yeah. yeah, feedback it's, it's is so important. To, yeah. Ideas, yeah. So, and I think probably the the success so far of your second flip starter is due to the power of you building so much trust with the ecosystem. And this is a very timely topic, right? Because with Smart BCH, there's so many new people coming into BCH, and it's so important uh, for new builders to build trust, right? To to put themselves out there, to put content out there, to show that they're they're doing things and be transparent. So. Yeah, I mean, I think you've you've done a great job of that. So yeah, um, it's a massive responsibility. Like it is. <laughs> it's part of. I don't know. It's. I think it's. I think being in the medical profession has helped in that situation because you know you take responsibilities day in day out for for the health of a, another human being, and we take that responsibility very seriously. And so if, if somebody gives you ten dollars or one dollar or twenty dollars, that donation um, you you take very seriously. Like the community has empowered you and entrusted you with something to, to do something for the good. And, you know, I don't know. I, th I feel like maybe it's part of the, the doctor in you that says, okay, well, we have to, we have to you know, respect that and earn, and that, earn that trust. So hmm. yeah, it's great. I mean, it's, it's helpful to have a community that, that believes in you. It's really yeah. helpful. Yeah, I approach it from a similar place, you know, with my flip starter that I did maybe around the same time you did yours. I just, consider it's it's like a, almost like a public trust you know it's just so important to be transparent and to to show off you know what you're doing and whatnot and to you know to complete it as well right. you know so that's right and so we had a nice comment on on a reddit today that says no no accountability in this project and what was amazing is that because there was so like i think we've gone over above and beyond I'm hoping it's a gold standard of accountability where we have our online ledger that shows every transaction that we've that we've used and we've annotated it and we've had multiple, you know, blogs about the progress and we've completed it on time under budget and it's all public. So mm. if somebody says no accountability, it's like, hold on, there's masses of evidence. Show me, show me any crowdfunding campaign that's been more accountable. And so mm. if you've raised the bar to that level, it's hard to argue. <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. It's the thing is people on Reddit don't have, they have short attention spans. So yeah. Right. Yeah, I would. I wouldn't take it too seriously. Yeah, but it's, it, the point is, it's nice to have that like evidence. Like it's irrefutable. Absolutely. It yeah, I I have a site at uh, stats.panmoney.com that Shamari Prince uh, developed for us, and it just lays out everything that we've done with photographs and, right. and stats Amazing. and stuff. Yeah, I love so stats. It's, it's so important. <laughs> Yeah, me too. <laughs> I love dashboards. <laughs> give, me, give me the stats. Show me what's happening. It's amazing. So uh, we're coming up on an hour. It's, I've been, I'm really grateful to have had your time today. Before we go, how can people find out more about you and connect with you? 
So um, I'm on Telegram. Um, I use uh, the username at Sakib N. Uh, we're on uh, Twitter, uh, Sakibnor.com or One Dot Surgery. Uh, email. Uh, I'm pretty much awake 24 hours a day, seven days a week. Most times, I'm, I'm very. You can find me awake at any time, doesn't matter what time zone. So, um, generally, if you contact me, I'm very responsive. Um, Telegram, Twitter, email. Um, that's that's where I would start. Okay, awesome. So yeah, we've been talking with Sakib Noor of One Dot Surgery. Really interesting uh, prod BCH centric organization project. Uh, the flip starter is at flipstarter two dot one dot surgery. Hurry up and get on that because it's almost done. Thanks, Sakib. It's been a real pleasure speaking with you. Thanks, George. Amazing opportunity. Thank you so much.